Good evening. Good evening. Let me try that once more. Good evening. I'm Crystal Collins Dudd, the president of Sarah Lawrence, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you tonight to the Longfellow Lecture. This, the Longfellow Lecture honors Cynthia Longfellow, an alumna of the college who made significant contributions to the well-being of children despite having died at a young age herself. She studied child development here at Sarah Lawrence. She worked at the Early Childhood Center, and she went on to work in the research division at, at Bank Street College of Education, and then to graduate study and professional work in Boston. And so it's a particular privilege that we have gathered people here from all of those institutions tonight, from the Early Childhood Center, from Bank Street, from the Child Development Program. Her family and her friends established this enrichment program in her memory, and for more than 30 years, it has brought eminent people to the campus to share their concerns for the needs of children and their work in research and applied areas of child development, pediatrics, education, and social justice work. We're del delighted to honor Cynthia's legacy tonight, and Barbara Schechter will introduce our speaker. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Sarah Lawrence. Um, before we start the program directly, um, I want to take a moment to share with you some wonderful news at our Child Development Institute, which is that we have a new director at CDI, and I want to welcome back Tricia Handley to Sarah Lawrence College, where all, yes, I see, I see the people, all the people who know you. Tricia, you want to, you want to stand up? Trish was a member of the Early Childhood Center faculty before going to a position at Barnard College Toddler Center, where she was teacher, administrator, supervisor, and parent advisor. Trish earned two master's degrees here at Sarah Lawrence, one in the art of teaching and in child development, and she participated in our um, CDI professional programs along the way, and now she is leading and coordinating them. So we're thrilled to have her back in this new capacity. Um, Dr. Fraser Brown is the first professor of playwork in the United Kingdom. That is my very favorite part of his bio. Some of you may know about the profession called playworker in England and in other parts of the world. You can get an undergraduate degree and study playwork in postgraduate play therapy programs there. That position of playworker is part child developmentalist, part recreation worker, part social worker. These professionals oversee children's play in public play adventure playgrounds found all over the country. Dr. Brown has an extensive list of publications on play and play work, some of which you will see outside at the end of the lecture. His wide-ranging research interests include the impact of deprivation on children's play, the assessment of play value in children's play spaces, and the role of play in the Montessori system of education. What I want to focus on in my brief words in, in this introduction is the very personal connection we have to this work at our Child Development Institute here at Sarah Lawrence, uh, which would never have happened if it were not for the pivotal role of a dear colleague and friend of ours who is maybe in the audience named Roger Hart. Has Roger appeared yet? Roger may come late. Some of you may know him or others know about him. Um, he's a longtime member of our professional advisory board and he introduced us to Penny Wilson, one of the early generation of play workers in London, who facilitated a trip that several of us from CDI made to London in 2008 to visit some of the adventure playgrounds and to meet a number of the play workers. That is how I came to meet Fraser Brown there 10 years ago. He had already been a play worker in London in the 1970s and had gone on to a number of managerial positions, including director of the Playwork Training Agency, Children First, for 10 years. He is currently the program leader for the BA Playwork degree at Leeds Beckett University and the specialist link tutor for the postgraduate play therapy courses run by the Academy of Play and Child Psychotherapy. So you can see how way ahead of us they are there. What many of you do not know is that the visit in 2008 was instrumental in our beginning to develop a series of outreach programs to our neighboring communities in Yonkers, the Bronx, and New York City to bring them our version of adventure play and to bring groups of children to our campus to engage in what we are now calling CAPES, Community Adventure Play Experiences. I want to mention a special word of fond, wel fond welcome to Marjorie Franklin 
who is here today, our teacher, colleague, and friend, faculty emerita of the college, who was also Don to Cynthia Longfellow, whom we brought back out of retirement, the first time she tried to retire, to direct our Child Development Institute for several years. Marjorie and I together created the original facilitating play professional development program, which begins tomorrow with a session led by Fraser Brown about his work in adventure playgrounds. Marjorie's lifelong commitment to children's play inspired much of our work, advocacy, and research on play here at the college for many decades. So, adventure play is not directly the subject of Fraser Brown's lecture today, but if you want to know more about our CAPES, our play programs, our training of play facilitators, check out our website or brochures which are available outside the auditorium. The subject of Fraser Brown's lecture today is the remarkable story of the work he has done beginning in 1999, bringing light to a very dark corner of the world. This is the story of his work with a group of abandoned children in a Romanian pediatric hospital and the impact of a therapeutic playwork project on them. The title of this talk has evolved. Some of you may have seen it written up as initially Children Without Hope. We have, the title has evolved to giving, chi giving children hope, the therapeutic value of play. This symbolic gesture captures the trajectory of the project. As we know all too well every day, so many children all over the world are without hope. This is the story of the small miracles which can happen in the unlikeliest of places when some caring person with a vision steps up. It is in that spirit of bringing light and hope where it is desperately needed that we are honored and delighted to welcome Dr. Fraser Brown to Sarah Lawrence. Well, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here, actually, and uh, I'm not sure I recognize that person who was just described. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, I'm going to talk substantially about the work in Romania, and uh, if I don't remember to say it at the end, I must say that it's not me that was the main uh, worker there, that there were people working for us and, and with us, and I wouldn't want to take all the credit uh, in that way. Um, so, I'm going to talk about play and playwork and therapeutic play and Romania. So I'm going to start by talking about play, what's so special about children's play. Well, I think it's there's lots of things that are special about it. It's delightful, it's enchanting, it promotes the development of motor skills, it uh, encourages social interaction, it develops essential life skills, it's about being in control, uh, sometimes it's about taking risks, it uh, allows children engagement with the environment, it's full of surprise, it can be challenging, sometimes dangerous, it provides us with lifelong res reference points, it has therapeutic elements, and it contributes to children's culture. And I could give a lecture on every single one of those things. In fact, some of them require a whole course. Uh, but I thought I would, I'm just going to touch on the first one, because quite a bit of this lecture is about sadness. And uh, so I wanted to start with something more charming. Let's see if we can make this work. Uh, let's see so my wife and I uh, support Chelsea Football Club. I think you would know it in, the, in America as a soccer club. Uh, but Chelsea Football Club, quite a successful football club in the UK. Um, at the end of every season, the, at the very last home game, the players go off the pitch and then they come back onto the pitch about 10 minutes later with their wives and girlfriends and their children. And at the end of the season, about three seasons ago, uh, this is what happened. The, the players come and stand in the middle, in the centre circle, and uh, a little boy started coming out of the centre circle with kicking a football. And I'll just let you see what happens. Uh, I have to say thank you also to my teammates. They not only these ones, but the, all the other ones that I play with, and they were fantastic.
Sarı Sign him up, yeah, sign him up. That's what they're singing. The reason I played that is because uh, um, it illustrates quite a number of things, actually, about uh, play. The uh, most obvious thing being uh, uh, Piaget tells us that children, uh, that a lot of what's going on when children are playing is what he refers to as the happy display of known actions. In other words, it's kind of about practice. Uh, I don't like that definition at all myself, but that's what one of the things that Piaget says. Uh, but clearly, this little boy is copying what he's seen his, his father do, even to the extent of when he scores the goal, he turns around and you know, does that. And, uh, but there's something else going on here, which I think is very significant, which is that the crowd is playing as well. And... Piaget actually suggests that uh, we don't really play very much after we develop logical operations. So round about the age of 12 or whatever, uh, we, I'm not sure he says we stop playing, but certainly we don't play in the same way. This is utter nonsense. We go on and on playing until we die. And uh, the crowd there, it's interesting what's going on. There's a kind of collective consciousness that takes place within the crowd. They gradually, the, the, the gradual ra rising of the, the noise in the ground, and even to the extent that once he, scored, once he scored his goal, presumably someone started chant chanting, sign him up, sign him up. But within seconds, you've got 35,000 people joining in and, and singing the song, and really basically having a laugh, which I think is rather charming. Anyway, most of the rest of this presentation is not quite as charming as that. So what is this presentation about? It, well, it's about children's play. It's about the profession of play work. Um, it's about the impact of play on child development. It's about the potentially therapeutic role of play in that process. It's about play workers working in extreme adversity. In fact, it's hard to imagine a more difficult place and setting to work. It's uh, play workers working with abandoned and abused children in Romania. It's also about a research project that we set up to study the impact of therapeutic play work on the children we were working with. So I just need to explain to you what was going on in Romania in the 1990s, and I'll just uh, take a few moments to fill you in on that. Um, in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War, Romania became a communist country. It's um, one of the Eastern Bloc countries. And uh, in the mid-1960s, uh, they had a new president called Nicolae Ceausescu. And he is kind of evidence of the old adage that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Some people would say he went mad, uh, but some of the things that went on in Romania uh, were completely um, hidden from the world because we had no access to Romania until he was overthrown. So at the end of 1989, he was overthrown, and gradually through the early 1990s, uh, the Western media began to get into Romania and, and understand what was, what was happening there. And uh, the most obvious thing that was discovered was that there were more than 100,000 children living in orphanages. More than 100,000 children uh, in a population of about 20 million. Um, so, and the orphanages, uh, by and large, I, I worked in one orphanage, uh, I spent time in one orphanage uh, where there were uh, 80 girls and two members of staff. So, and as you imagine, when you're uh, working in an orphanage, it's 24 hours a day, seven days a week. How on earth did two members of staff cope with that? And in, in actual fact, it wasn't quite as chaotic as you would imagine because what, what happened in practice was 
uh, the older girls kind of took control of the place and they controlled the, the younger girls and the younger girls controlled the younger girls and so on. So it was a bit like um, the Lord of the Flies book, you know. Um, but it kind of got through. So that's one example. Um, Ceausescu had believed that he wanted to enlarge his, uh, his workforce and so he had a belief that you could do that by uh, enlarging the, uh, he want, sorry, he wanted to develop his industry and he thought you could do that by enlarging the word workforce. So contraception was banned uh, until you had uh, five children and this was the poorest country in Europe and within the 20 million population are the, or were the poorest of the poor, the Roma population, a gypsy population, around about two million. And uh, so you've got the poorest of the poor living in circumstances where uh, they have to have five children before, before they can start using contraception. If you had, I think it was 12 children, you got taken to the presidential palace and given a medal. He at one point thought that, um, oh, and by the way, they had a branch of the police who went round checking women to see whether they were using any form of contraception or whether they'd had abortions or whatever. Uh, the Romanian population rather ironically called that branch of the police the baby, the baby police. Um, Ceausescu had an idea that it would be a good idea for babies to be given a blood transfusion immediately after they were born. And uh, so, obviously a very poor country, they didn't have any blood banks, so they imported blood from the West, and it's fairly widely uh, accepted that they imported the AIDS virus into the baby population. So in the early 1990s, going through 93, 94, our television screens were full of images of dying babies and of these uh, orphanages uh, with the incredibly overcrowded and abusive to the children who lived there. Uh, a girl called Wanda Smith, uh, left school at 16 and went off to work in one of these orphanages. And after she'd worked there for three years, I think, she came back to the UK and came on our course, on the Playwork course. And uh, in her second year, she went off to do her practical placement work and she went back to an orphanage in uh, Bucharest. And my wife and I went out to visit her and what we saw, I would say, changed our lives in many ways. Uh, it was horrendous. And we came back wanting to get involved in some way. So we got involved with an organization called the White Rose Initiative. And uh, the White Rose Initiative worked in a town called Sigishwara in the middle of Romania. Uh, not only with children, they worked in um, with old people's homes, nurseries, hospitals, in all sorts of areas. And uh, they were approached by uh, a new director of hospitals who had just been appointed. So he was uh, in charge of five hospitals. And uh, the way he told it to me was that he was shown round all his hospitals uh, and he came to the paediatric hospital and in the paediatric hospital he came upon this ward which had 16 children in, all tied in their cots. Uh, and he asked the nurse who was showing him round what was wrong with the children and she said there's nothing wrong with them, they're just, they live here. They were abandoned when they were born and we've got nowhere to send them so they've lived here ever since. The children were ranged in age from um, six, uh, nine months up to 12 years old. And as far as we could make out, they had all been tied in their cots, probably from the age of about six months, with catastrophic effects. And uh, I'm going to show you 
uh, some video footage. But um, so the director, a guy called Cornell, approached the White Rose Initiative because he didn't have any money. So uh, he approached them to see if they could do anything about these children. He wanted to, I think, quite naively, he wanted just to have someone come and play with the children to see if that would help. The White Rose Initiative uh, went and found a girl who had been abandoned herself, actually, 19-year-old girl called Edith Buss, and they brought her over to the UK and uh, she came and did a sort of crash training course with me. She spent time in the Leeds General Infirmary working with a play specialist, a friend of mine, and she spent time in uh, the Ebor Gardens Nursery working with a nursery teacher, a friend of a colleague. And at the end of every day, she came back to the uh, university, back to my office, and we spent time going through everything she'd experienced during that day and trying to relate it to what she might experience when she went back to Romania to work with these 16 children. So, I just want to show a little bit of video footage. I'll explain why it says Sophie Webb in a minute. So this is uh, the first week, this is Edit's first week at work. And the children are all, you have to excuse the sort of grainy images. As you can see, the children are tied in their cots with torn up sheets. They will be, uh, as I said, ranging in age from uh, nine months up to 12 years old. Uh, they were not fed more than once a day. They were fed a, a diet of uh, rice and meat. And Edith, when she arrived, found that the, um, the nurses were stealing the meat. And so the children were really being fed on a, a diet of rice and some sort of meat gravy, really. So Edith put a stop to that, obviously. Uh, they were, their nappies were changed no more than once a day. See this little boy, is, he's tied to the back of the cot with a torn up sheet. Their nappies were changed no more than once a day. When they were sick, they were treated with shared needles and some of them would have been HIV positive, so that's extremely dangerous. This little girl's been tied to the back of her cot with a, her own T-shirt. So this is the first week at work that Edit faced. And uh, I said that we did a training course with her, but nothing could have prepared her for what she had to cope with, really. So after six months, I've just slotted this in to give you an idea of where this is leading. <laughs> These are the same children, exactly the same children. And as you can see, although they're still uh, trapped in a hospital ward with, with grills at the cage, they're their behaviour is entirely different. So they're kind of with each other. Could you hold it there? So their behaviour is uh, changed. They're now interacting with each other. And uh, later on, I will show you lots of footage of the, some of the individual children and the progress they made. Um, the reason the name Sophie Webb is on there is because after Edit had been working there for um, three months, I sent one of our students out to work with her. Um, something I wouldn't do again, but, but uh, so I sent one of our students out, that was Sophie Webb. And uh, when I eventually went to visit her, the, what I witnessed was uh, I would say changed my life actually, changed the way I teach, it changed the way, it changed a lot of the, uh, my thoughts about, is that, that's not the video is it? All oh, right, good, right. <laughs> um, 
it changed the way I thought about child development a lot because of the rapid change that took place in, in the lives of these children. But standing there watching the impact that had taken place in such a short period of time, I also had a kind of academic hat on, a researcher's hat on, and the thing that struck me was that uh, every day the two girls were untying the children, they were changing their nappies, they were feeding them properly, they were taking them to a room that we'd been given, the playroom, uh, that we'd been given by the director of the hospitals, um, and working with them all through the day and changing their nappies when that was necessary and so on, but playing with them in a playwork way all through the day. And, uh, and then at the end of the day, they would take them back to the ward and leave them, and for sure they would be tied up again and not fed properly and just no attention given to them at all. So, and there was nothing we could do about that for a while anyway. And so my academic hat was saying, really there's something quite unique here. Um, if we can identify developmental change in these children, uh, we will definitely be able to say that the change is due to their experience of the Playwork project because nothing else has changed in their lives. And it's very, very rare that anybody working in any child development setting can make that sort of claim. You know, my, my wife's a, uh, an early years teacher. She would love to be able to say that she taught somebody to read or whatever, but you can never be absolutely sure because you just can't really know what's gone on in the rest of their lives. But in this circumstance, it w we knew exactly what was happening. Nothing had changed. So they were still experiencing the things that had led them to be sitting, rocking in their cots, completely oblivious of each other in the room. Now, I'm just going to try and go through quickly because I'm sure there are a lot of people in the room who don't know what playwork is. So I'll just try and sum it up as quickly as I can. So the idea of playwork is that uh, it's rooted in an understanding that children learn and develop while they're playing and that the nature of modern life often works against that process. So there are many reasons for that, such as the increase in traffic, uh, our, our modern day obsession with academics, uh, our fear of strangers and so on. So lots of things mean that children are not free to play in the way they have been able to in the past. So the prime focus and essence of playwork is to support and facilitate the play process. It's about the role of the play worker is to support all children and young people in the creation of a space in which they can play. So it's about creating spaces that enable children to play. So when it comes to play work in practice, there's two major things that we have to consider. First is that we have to identify and remove any barriers to the play process. So for example, um, as Barbara said, I originally worked in an adventure playground and uh, um, uh, if you don't know what an adventure playground is, it's a, it's a place where uh, children are free to use all sorts of junk materials, scrap materials, to create their own play space and to destroy it if they want to and recreate it. So it's a constantly ongoing sort of changing place. Uh, the one I worked at uh, was sited between the housing estate and the most popular bar. And so people walk, used to walk from the bar past the playground late at night and toss their empty bottles over the fence. So I had to go around, before we opened up for the day, I had to go around the, the fence and make sure there was no broken glass around because that would be a barrier, that would be a barrier to play, it's, you know, children can't play if they've got cut knees and things. So that's a sort of simple idea. Given the, the setting that I've just been talking about though, here's another barrier, you know, we had to untie the children. We had to feed them properly, we had to, you know, make sure they were sort of clean and healthy and so, well, not healthy, but certainly clean anyway. Um, so all those things vary in significance according to the setting that you're working in. Once you've removed all 
as many of the barriers as you can, uh, then it's about enriching the play environment. And I could go into a lot of detail about how that takes place, but I uh, haven't really got time to. So what about therapeutic playwork? That's a particular strand of playwork. So therapeutic playwork makes use of the therapeutic aspects of play to help children. So play, uh, Freud says that children use play to come to terms with traumatic events. So horrible things that happen in your life, children will play them out. They'll, they'll invent scenarios in, in order to come to an understanding of what's happened to them and also to take control of what's happened to them. Uh, it also helps children deal with various psychosocial difficulties and it helps them realize optimal growth and development. That's what therapeutic playwork is about. Um, people who are working in this field that though need to understand the child's world and it's very important that they separate themselves from their own world uh, and move into the conceptual world of children. So the first stage of therapeutic play work is, is adoption of a systematic use of a specific interpersonal style to create strong relationships with the children. And that's really what I'm going to talk about briefly here. So these are fundamentals of therapeutic play work. It's about creating a safe and secure place. It's about unconditional positive regard and suspension of prejudices. It's about acceptance of children as both being, being and becoming. And it's about all those other things that are on that list. And what I'm going to do is just highlight, highlight one or two of those things and, and then show you some more of the video footage which illustrate, helps to illustrate those ideas. So the first one I want to look at is unconditional positive regard. And really, that's sim simply put, and this is a very con con complex idea, it's, it's uh, Carl Rogers' idea, unconditional positive regard, but applying it in this therapeutic playwork setting, it's basically looking at the idea that all children are different, but you, but you have to give them positive regard no matter who they are. So they may be little angels, or they may not be. You have to be open-minded and non-judgmental. And uh, I'll just read you something out of a, a book that I did. Barbara mentioned Penny Wilson before, a colleague of mine. And uh, she sent me a little story that was included in a book called Foundations of Playwork. Penny Wilson uh, worked a lot with uh, children with learning difficulties. And uh, so this is one of her observations. She's, she's taken some of these kids to the park. Uh, two boys she's working with. Both boys are considered to have learning disabilities, enough to attend a special school. First boy says, look, there's John. John is a member of the park's staff. Look, there's John. Second boy says, John, washing machine. That's because he was installing a washing machine on the site. The first boy then says, he was president of America, wasn't he? <laughs> Who was? John Washing Machine. <laughs> Don't be silly, that was George Washing Machine. <laughs> and there he is. But Penny says, you know, the, the humour there was deliberate and shared and it would be very easy to have dismissed those boys because someone has said there they've got a learning difficulty. So you should not, you have to be open-minded, you have to be non-judgmental. You also have to be non-directive. It's about working to the child's agenda. I would go so far as to say that play workers are the only people who work with children who work to the child's agenda. So we respond to the cues that are given to us by the children. It's, it's very difficult for uh, teachers being the most obvious example, um, teachers have to work to an adult agenda. There is always a curriculum that you, you have to be teaching. So there's always an adult agenda involved in teaching, as there is with almost anybody who works with children. But, but the, the idea of a play worker is to go as far as you can with the flow of what the children are about. 
and I'm just going to read you a little observation that was done by uh, an ex-student of ours, a girl called Catherine Press. And uh, she, obviously, being an ex-student of ours, is a qualified play worker. She's also a qualified Montessori teacher. So she's working, when she made this observation, she's working in a, uh, a Montes uh, sorry, not a Montes but a, an ordinary nursery in the middle of London, and uh, she's working with three- and four-year-old children. So she says, it's snack time, and picking up on the relaxed atmosphere, I lie on the floor in the middle of the children while they have their snacks. See, that's a kind of playwork thing to do in a way. Uh, so, I lie on the floor in the middle of the children while they have their snacks. Jerry says, look, Catherine's fallen asleep. I open one eye and look at Jerry. He laughs and runs back to his seat. Martin says, that's not Catherine, it's a troll. I then begin to snore loudly. The children laugh and start to get excited. Two children come over with their apples and put them on my tummy. As I move to get the apples, the children run back to their seats. I pretend to eat the apples, but sit up and start to sniff. I think there must be children moving around. I can smell children when they move close to me. Yum, yum. They all scream and run back to their seats. Lisa creeps into the home corner. Let's get some pretend food for the troll. She puts the food on a plate and pushes it towards me. I sniff again. Oh, yuck. That's not my food. My food's children. Lisa laughs. Then Jodie gets a teddy from the cuddly toy box. She creeps up to me with the toy and puts it by my head. Here you go, Mr. Troll. I got you a teddy. She sits back. I slowly start to stroke the teddy. I start to smile and cuddle the teddy bear. I sit up slowly and still cuddling the teddy, I walk out of the classroom. I come back in as Catherine. Hello, everyone. I just saw a really funny troll holding a teddy. Did you? The children start to tell me about their adventure with the troll and how he could smell them and wanted to eat them if they moved. Not one single child said the troll was me. Now, you could write a whole book about that last sentence, actually. Not one single child said the troll was me. There's that whole, whole thing about children's ability to separate fantasy from reality and mix the two up when they when it suits them and and so on I mean it's amazing it's amazing but that's not why I read it to you the reason I read it to you is because what you've got there is uh, a play worker responding to the, the cues that have been given her by the children she lies down uh, while they're having their snacks and it and as soon as the child says that's not Catherine it's a troll from then on, everything she does is a response to what the children are doing. And that's a, a different way of working with children, I think. Uh, it's important that we have a, f a flexibility in the environment, lots of loose parts, if we can. Uh, and I'll explain what that means. There's a, a, a theory developed by someone called Simon Nicholson that goes like this. He says, in any environment, both the degree of inventiveness and creativity and the possibility of discovery and di are directly proportional to the number and kind of variables in it. So, in other, so the more loose parts there are in an environment, the more creative people are likely to be. And the way I usually explain that, if I'm explaining that to uh, my students in Leeds, uh, I, we tend to teach in classrooms, in old-fashioned classrooms, and I usually say to the, ch the students, uh, I want you to get into groups of th three or four, and I want you to make a den, or a fort, or a camp, whatever you call it, out of anything you find in this room. So there's, obviously, there's tables and chairs, and there's their, their coats and waste paper bins, and all sorts of things lying around and they really get into it, believe me, they love it. And within five minutes, they'll have made a den. And I guarantee that two-thirds of them are actually hiding in their dens. And you see, I think there's a whole book to be written about that as well. But, uh, and then when we come back together, what I say is, 
And how would you have managed if we, I'd asked you to do that in a lecture theatre? Now, conveniently, we're in a lecture theatre. It would be very, very difficult because there's, there, the chairs are fixed, the tables are fixed. It's, it's not easy to be creative in a fixed environment l like this one. Whereas if there's loose parts lying around, it's, it, it is easy and the, the environment encourages it. So coming back to what I described as the fundamentals, uh, you'll notice perhaps that some of those at the bottom of the page there about specific techniques of joining and uh, using rhythmic interaction and so on, uh, and adopting nonverbal communication modes and so on. I haven't touched on them, but I hope I will be able to touch on them as I go through and show you more of the video footage. Uh, but before I do that, I just want to highlight one small experiment that was done in the 1960s and 1960s by a developmental psychologist called Harry Harlow. Uh, Harlow removed baby monkeys from their mothers at birth and reared them in, in complete isolation in cages that were exactly like this. And uh, so they had a cloth mother as he called them, surrogate mothers. They had a cloth mother or a wire mother. The wire mother had a feeding bottle and he thought originally that they, the baby monkey would attach to the thing that fed it. Uh, in actual fact, he found that the baby monkeys attached to the cloth mother. And he came to the conclusion that it was all to do with touch and so on. Uh, but I'm not going to go into all that detail. What happened was, wh when he released these these monkeys into cage into areas with other monkeys, it became very apparent that they didn't know how to relate to the other monkeys. They would either freeze or they might pick a fight with the wrong monkey and get badly hurt, and so on. So he came to the conclusion that. Uh, these monkeys, the baby monkeys who'd been isolated, reared in isolation, were not able to uh, play with other monkeys. They were not able to uh, exhibit social skills that, that you might expect of a, a juvenile monkey. Uh, so what did he do? One of the things he did was he did the same experiment, took baby monkeys away from their mothers at birth and reared them in isolation, but gave them 20 minutes a day in a cage with a normally developing baby monkey. And to his amazement, what he found was that the baby monkeys who were being reared in isolation apart from the, their play experience, they grew, grew up to be relatively normal. Even to the ex extent that they could uh, uh, mate successfully and rear their own baby monkeys successfully. So these baby, now juvenile monkeys, had never seen an adult, and yet they knew how to behave in re relation to th their own babies. So amazing stuff, really. And he came to the conclusion that, uh, that play was the key. <coughs> He was also left with a whole load of uh, juvenile, highly disturbed juvenile monkeys. So what's he going to do with them? And he tried all sorts of ways of trying to help these uh, juvenile monkeys recover. And the only way that worked in any sense at all was if he put the juvenile monkeys into a cage with a baby monkey a normally developing baby monkey. And it seemed as if the disturbed juveniles were able to go right back to the beginning and start again in the company of the, the normally developing baby. Uh, the reason I'm telling you this <laughs> is because it's absolutely relevant to the work that we did. So Harlow and Saromi, when they wrote up their extensive experiments, which by the way are appalling, you couldn't do those sorts of experiments now. But that doesn't mean that we can't learn from what was done. So they came to these two conclusions, that no play makes for a very socially disturbed monkey, 
and that the presence of a younger monkey engaging in age-specific play can enable the damaged monkey to recover. He called the baby monkey in that circumstance a therapist monkey. Now, as you'll see when I go on to the video footage, you'll see that we had a therapist baby. So, uh, could we start the video again? So Sophie and I uh, started to do the research project and what we did was we decided to focus in on individual children. So this is Christina. Uh, Christina, we were told, uh, would not touch any human beings. She wouldn't have any physical contact with anybody. And as you can see, someone's put a... Uh, so here she is in the playroom. And she's got a, this is her first hour in the playroom. Uh, she's already got something in her hand that she's interested in. This is her second hour in the playroom. And you can see, you could say that she's still rocking like she was in the cot. But it's obviously a completely different sort of rocking, different sort of quality of rocking. And by the end of the first day, she was wanting to cuddle everybody she could possibly get her hands on. So a very, very rapid change in her behaviour. This is Carol. Uh, when we first were working with Carol, uh, he hadn't played with the other children at all until Sophie got there because he was HIV positive. So this is very typical of what the way the children were, grabbing the bars of the cots, rocking. Um, could you freeze it there, please? Okay, now, so you can see that he's tied into one cot and he's uh, managed to climb out of that cot and he's now trapped. He can't move. So, uh, and Sophie thought it was so important to have that on video uh, that she actually gave him something to eat while she, while she took this little tiny bit of video. But that was the circumstances that he was living in. He was, the, the nurses had not allowed him to play with the other children, that they wouldn't let Edit take him out of his cot and play with the other children because they were worried that he was HIV positive and therefore the other children might catch something. Now, you can't catch something. It's not, it doesn't work like that. But, and, uh, but Edit didn't want to challenge the nurses because she was frightened we might get thrown out of the hospital. Uh, but when Sophie went over, Sophie took him out of his cot and just took him to the, uh, down to the playroom. So she lifted him out. Of the, so can we go on? So here he is out of his cot, I think probably for about three weeks probably. And he's, uh, he's three years old. Um, this is Sophie's knees here. And as he backs away, you'll see how unsteady he is on his feet. Three years old and his m gross motor skills are really, really, really poor. Now this, he's been out of his cot now for six weeks, I think. And you see how he's much more s firm on his feet already. Uh, in this clip, he's been out of his cot now for six months and uh, he's playing with Luciana with uh, the bucket of soapy water, <laughs> having a drink. <laughs> okay, could you freeze it, please? Right, now what's happening here, I mentioned play cues before. What's happening here is, uh, this is a play cue. Play cues are very often very ambiguous. In other words, they, they may look like one thing, but they're something else entirely. What's happening here is he's saying, ta ta Tatai. He's actually, in fact, he goes like that. It's almost as if he's trying to drag you in. He's basically saying, come and play with me. So he's actually, he, the words he's using are tatai, which is goodbye. But he's not saying goodbye and running away. He's saying tatai. So uh, he, there's even this sort of little playful thing going on in his voice. Tatai. Ta -ta, and this like that and the way he's walking he's, he's, he kind of, he's walking like this 
So there's no intention to run away. He's also adopted uh, what um, the, the ethologist called the curvilinear spine, which a lot of animals adopt, not just human beings, which uh, um, is an indication that you're being playful. So this is, it's a kind of a twisted spine. And that's an indication that uh, you're wanting to be playful. Okay, could you? Now you see that his uh, motor skills are developing pretty well. Um, he can now throw and catch and so on. He's, he's been out of his cot now for about six months. And then the, the next image is, this is me tossing a ball up in the air and he's wanting me to throw it to him. So what he does is he backs away and uh, he keeps eye contact with me and basically saying he can't speak English and I can't speak very good Romanian. So you see what happens when you respond in the right way to a play cue, he's so excited he stuffs it in his mouth. And obviously, you, you have to keep responding. I, I, I think, yeah, I'm not very good at the game, actually. But <laughs> <laughs> So that's uh, Carol. Now, Virgil. Uh, Virgil would not eat unless he was standing up. Could you freeze it again, please? Now, uh, this is a very intelligent child. When we were first working with these children, it was impossible to tell which children had been born with brain damage and which had not. So, some of them clearly had, but it was impossible because all of them were sitting in their cots rocking and sometimes doing this, this kind of weaving motion. But they weren't aware of the other children in the room at all. They weren't interacting with the other children. Um, Clearly their, their growth is stunted. All, I was going to say their social skills are stunted, but their social skills were, were non-existent. Um, however, as soon as we started working with the children, it became immediately apparent which ones of them uh, were um, where there was nothing wrong with them when they were born. Uh, they spurred into life, uh, incredible pace and Virgil probably the most extreme of them so when Sophie rang me up and said that he won't sit down to eat he wants to stand up why do you think that is uh, my feeling was that because he's a very intelligent child he has spent uh, all of his life being fed at the bars of a cot by a nurse coming round with a bowl and a spoon and just shoving it in his mouth and going on to the next child and shoving it in their mouth. And so that's, as I say, he's intelligent. So he thinks, oh, that's the way you, you f eat proper. That's the proper way to eat. So we had to kind of encourage him to uh, sit down and, and eat at the table. And the way Sophie did that was to t identify his favorite toy and uh, let him bring it down from the playroom, let him bring it to the, uh, to the ward where they had their food and sit with it, holding on to it. And I think over a period of about two days, he would hold on to the, the toy and he would try and eat with his other hand, you know. Uh, but gradually, I think he worked out that that was quite difficult, really. And so, after about two days, he was sitting down and eating. That is Sophie really making use of Winnicott's idea of the transitional object. That that the this is the concept that um, that children identify safety and security in, in some of the toys that they play with. The most obvious one being a teddy bear. Um, and so they use that. They will, they will, it, because they can hang on to their teddy bear or whatever. Uh, in, the, in his case, it was a bus, I think, a toy bus. Um, that that gives them the security to uh, uh, take a risk in an environment where they they feel insecure. So thank you. Yes. So Virgil, by the way, is uh, he's six. 
six years old, looks about two. But he's a clever lad, you see. He's got hold of the torch and he's worked out how the torch works and he wants to show his friends. He was really on the go. As soon as you took him out of his cot, he was on the go from morning to night. I mean, desperate, desperate to learn, you know, in a way that I suppose human beings should be. And he made such incredible progress in, in a very, very short space of time. He's one of the reasons why I had some severe doubts about Piaget's ages and stages view of the way children develop. So here's an example of a child learning while they're playing. I think he's seen uh, other people drawing things with crayons, so he's, he's sort of trying it out for himself. And that's the way children, little children, learn, obviously. Uh, they try things out, and if it doesn't work, they have another go, do something else. So you see that he's tried it with his left hand and his right hand, and now he's going to try it with three pencils at once. You know, Jerome Brunner says play gives children the freedom to fail, and that, I think that's a very good summary. So here he is uh, in the ward with nothing to play with, and uh, he's playing with nothing. This is quite significant. So Edit has given him nothing. Oh, he didn't take it, so she said, you've forgotten it. Now watch, he actually adjusts it. So could you hold it there, please? This is uh, Piaget, I'm having a go at Piaget here. <laughs> One of my favorite people. Um, Piaget talks about symbolic play. And Piaget says that uh, there are three types of symbolic play. Uh, the first type being uh, kind of where it's a very clear represent, the thing you're playing with is a very clear representation of the thing it's supposed to be. So a doll, a doll looks like a baby, doesn't it? And so you can play with it as a baby. A little toy car looks like a toy, like a car, and you play with it as a car. Uh, and Piaget says that's the most basic form of symbolic play. And then children move on towards uh, where they're using objects to represent something uh, that they don't really look like. So, for example, this bottle could easily be a, to a, a toy car if you wanted it to be. It could be a baby if you want it to be a baby. You know, it depends the way you see it, you know. So then Piaget says the final stage of symbolic play is where children are playing with abstract concepts. And that's what's happening there. This boy is playing at transporting things from Edit round the room and putting them in Alex's bucket there. So the whole of the play is going on in an abstract form in his mind. And as I say, Piaget takes, says that that sort of uh, development of symbolic play takes about three years to develop, really. Virgil developed it in about three months. So thank you, yeah. So the next child is Liliana. Now, uh, the hospital authorities found Liliana's parents and paid them to take her back. And uh, two weeks later, she was left on the steps of the hospital with uh, no clothes on and with both her hips broken, with both her jaws broken and with a lot of broken ribs. And I must admit, I actually thought she was going to die. Um, but Edit did a lot of work with her, bringing her back, really pushing her to, to come on. And as you can see, so in this clip here, you see Edit is really pushing her to, to use her limbs again and so on. Uh, but in the next clip, so they're playing a kind of patty cake game. And as you can see, Liliana is actually beginning to take the lead in the, in the game. So she's come on in leaps and bounds in no time at all. As I say, I, I was very amazed by this because I saw her when she first came back in and she really looked like, like she couldn't survive. Uh, Nikolai. So Nikolai, when we were first working with Nikolai, he was obsessed with shoes. And uh, as soon as you walked into the 
the ward or the playroom, he would be taking your shoes off and putting them on his hands and he'd be having his shoes off and putting them on your hands and so on. And see there, he's just stolen Luciana's shoes. He, he's not going to give it back either. Um, so he's obsessed with shoes. And, uh, but we had a little dilemma with him. Could you freeze it there, please? We had a little dilemma with him. Uh, by the way, he's 10 years old. Uh, 10 years old, and he spent his whole life tied in a cot. And when we took him out of the cot, he, walk, he would walk around the, the ward, hanging on to the bars of the cot all the time. And that's how he walked. He just went round and round and round the room, you see. And if you put him, if you got hold of him, put him in the middle of the ward, he would just fall down onto the floor, crawl across the floor, pull himself up, onto the bars of the cot and off he'd go again around the room, see. So Sophie was trying to encourage him to find a way, or she was trying to find a way that he would actually walk by himself. So what she did was she basically played shoes with him. Now this is, I mentioned before, a, a specific technique. It's a technique developed by the Option Institute uh, who work substantially with autistic children. And uh, it's a... It, um, the idea is that instead of trying to get the child to behave in the way you want them to, you don't do that. You actually join them in their behaviour, in their be peculiar behaviour. So in this case, Sophie basically played shoes with him for several days, I think. She, she played his game of shoes. And what happens then in that joining process is you form a strong relationship with the child. The child actually comes to trust you because in his mind, uh, he's actually somewhere in there, he's thinking, oh, this person understands me. This person wants to be behaving like I do. And he feels comfortable with you and forms a relationship with you. So could you run on the video, please? So on this occasion, this is, so Sophie's playing with him, and then uh, you'll see she puts him at a distance. And you see, the temptation of, of getting a cuddle from his friend is much more powerful than the fear of falling over. So he goes for that. Now, here's something uh, that we did completely by accident. So this is a 10-year-old child uh, who is trying to learn you know, to, to walk properly. And uh, can you just freeze it there? Um, I noticed that... Um, Children love chasing balloons. So, you know, there were lots of balloons blown up and so on. And this is not deliberate at all. But balloons don't fly in a straight line. So if you're trying to encourage a child to develop their gross motor skills, their inclination is to walk in a straight line. But if they're chasing a balloon, they can't. They, they have to manoeuvre because the balloon moves all over the place. So it actually encourages them to develop those, those changes of direction and so on. As I say, complete accident. I'd, I would love to pretend that I thought that up. Um, so here he is in the ward. And uh, although uh, Nikolai was born uh, two months premature and weighing less than two pounds and clearly has quite serious brain damage, he nevertheless made uh, progress uh, w with us, not like Virgil, but he did, really did make progress. And here's some in, an indication of it. He's trying to get Edit to chase him. So can you show the, the video again? So he's chasing her, that's the game, but he wants her to chase him. So first he bangs on the table, but she doesn't get the message. So next he knocks over the mattress, he even goes, oh dear, oh dear. No, she still didn't get the message. That's her coat hanging on the window. And what he's done is, he's put his hand into her coat pocket. <laughs> you 
Isn't that brilliant? Can you freeze it there just a minute? Um, the thing I will say about that is that the inc inclination for a lot of, a lot of adults who, who work with children would be, in those circumstances, circumstances would be to give moral guidance it, uh, not discipline you know not tough discipline but a lot of people their inclination would be to now Nikolai it's not really right you shouldn't really be putting your your hand into someone else's coat pocket you know I, we do it without almost thinking but but what's happened there thankfully is is Eddie didn't do that you know He's not being a naughty boy. He's trying to get her to do something. And quite cleverly, quite a sophisticated sort of action he's taken there and with successful results. Okay. So Alex is our therapist baby. Uh, Alex was only nine months old when we were working with this group of children. And therefore he had not been tied in his cot for any great length of time. So to some extent, his, his behavior patterns are what you would have expect, what you would expect of a one-year-old child. And uh, this is two little short clips that illustrate his impact on the group. So could you just freeze it there, please? Uh, what you've got there is a huge, great, big, cuddly toy. You've got Alex, who at this time would be about 15 months old, uh, Virgil, who's six years old, and Nikolai, who's 10 years old, and they're all playing with a big, cuddly toy. Now, you wouldn't normally expect a 10-year-old child to do that, but the, the, the fact that Alex is there means that the other children can kind of join in uh, it seems natural to them. So they can join in with someone doing something that actually feels very natural to them because they're right at the beginning of their learning process, their development process as well. So he he's, has a really good influence on the rest of the group. Not Nothing deliberate on our part, it's just the fact that he's there is the significant thing. Okay, could you run it on again and I'll show you something else. In the next clip, Luciana has been punished by one of the nurses because she screamed when she was given an injection. So you see she bangs her head on the cot. She's in a right old state. And uh, here's Alex. Now, I promise you this is not staged. Uh, and he spent around five minutes trying to get the cuddly toy through the bars of the, the cot. Now, how does he know that that is going to help his friend? You know, he's obviously been studying Winnicott. <laughs> yeah. Look, there we are. She's not very grateful, but... <laughs> <laughs> she obviously hasn't been studying Winnicott. So uh, this is the... Yeah, this is the final child, Elena. Now, when we are first working with Elena, she... Uh, she wouldn't have anything to do with the other children at all. That weaving motion is very, very common in a, a, a disturbed child. Um, everything went in the mouth. She's six years old. Freud says, you know, the oral stage happens around about nine months. Um, she wouldn't really interact with the other children at all, no matter how much you encouraged her. And, uh, but what Sophie noticed was that there was something she did that she really enjoyed. And we'll see that in a minute. So Luciana's coming to try and play with Elena. Look at the pain on her face. She doesn't want to play with other children. But look at what happens here. Okay, can we freeze it? Uh, there, lovely. See, that is the face of a very happy child. Oops. A uh, very happy child, isn't it? And Sophie noticed that, that there, this Elena was nev never so happy as when she was standing in a corner by herself going, wah, 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 wah. So, again, ad adopting this principle of joining. Right, could you run it on now, please? Um, Sophie sat her down opposite her and, yeah.
Now, just as luck would have it, you see the, uh, the time is 6.15. This sequence takes about two minutes. And you'll see that to begin with, Sophie is taking a lead. She's looking at Elena face to face going wah, wah, wah. But you notice that she's holding her hand. Now, Elena wouldn't let anybody touch her until this. And lots of smiling and so on. So I think Elena's trying to work out how the sound is being made, maybe. But you see now Sophie actually strokes her and Elena's reaction is a pleasure, you know. Now, So Sophie has joined her in the action of wah, wah, wah. And immediately you've got a relationship building. But the amazing thing is coming up now. You see, at the end there, it's very, very difficult to tell who started that. Even though, could we freeze it there? Um, even though Sophie started it in the first place at 6.15, by 6.17, actually, they look face to face and it's almost as if they've, they've, they've become synchronized. You know, it's almost as if they've been rehearsing that. But there they are going, wow, wow, in, in synchronized uh, behavior. Okay, now uh, we've got a choice now. Um, we've got 10 to 7. We can either stop there and uh, take a few questions, or I have got some video footage of the children six years down the line. Okay. <laughs> Anybody want to just... <laughs> okay, on we go then. It doesn't take, it's only about five minutes. So, uh, could you actually, could you just hold it? Sorry, um, it ju I should explain this. So, uh, I showed this video footage um, immediately afterwards, you know, back in 2000, 2001 and so on. And there, was some, uh, there are people here who've actually seen it before, uh, back then. Uh, but several people would say to me afterwards, and what's happened to the children now? Well, what happened to them was that in the first 18 months of this project, uh, 13 of them were either adopted or fostered within Romania. Uh, sadly, the other three children were taken, were transferred to children's mental hospitals. And if you think you've just seen some pretty dire circumstances, you should see the children's mental hospitals, unbelievable. Um, but anyway, the 13 were either fostered or adopted, and I always felt that that was a, a very good indication of how successful we'd been, because uh, in the early stages of the project, I, you'd have had to be an absolute saint to adopt one of those children. Uh, but once the project had gone on, and you see, for example, Elena sitting there wah, wah, wah with, with Sophie, then you, I'm sure that people would come in and, and think, well, perhaps I could help this child. You know, it, it would be a good thing to do. Um, so 13 out of 16 were adopted or fostered. Uh, and people said to me, do you know what's happened to them subsequently? So six years on, I set about trying to uh, locate some of them. And uh, it wasn't an easy task, believe me. But I did manage to locate six of them, I think. I think I've got video footage of four of them, and uh, maybe five, but um, anyway, we'll see. So these are the same children uh, six years on, some of them anyway. 
and uh, it's not all good news, by the way. So, okay. Could you turn the sound down again, please? So, this is uh, the child who was so badly damaged, had her hips broken and her jaws broken and so on. Her foster mother actually didn't really want me to start filming until she'd got her properly dressed and everything. But um, So, as you can see, she's there in a... There's a centre that the children would come to uh, after school and uh, she's obviously there playing with the other children. Now, it's not true to say that uh, a child who has been abused that badly for uh, over a long period of time is now completely well again, uh, um, but certainly there's considerable progress there. Uh, the, the second child I located was Alex, who was our therapist baby. And there is no doubt that if he'd been left in the circumstances that you saw him, uh, he would have developed in the same way as those other children. Um, but he was adopted by um, some people who sent him to a German-speaking nursery. So here he is. He just said to me, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> and now he's, uh, this lovely lady on the left here has given them some sweets and uh, and he offered me one yeah. and I, sa I said uh, semester, which is thank you in Romanian and, and he says Kubla Cherry which means uh, don't mention it uh, so could you freeze it there so he <laughs> he was trying to teach me to count in German and you can imagine what a complete mess I made of it. And then he started mimicking me, making a mess of counting in German. You can't get much more normal than that, I think. <laughs> okay. Now, the next one I think is Elena. Yeah. Uh, Elena, two years after the video footage you've seen of her face to face with Sophie, um, I actually managed to find her and uh, I went to the house where she'd been uh, adopted and uh, she'd made a very good relationship with someone she called Grandma and uh, she came and sat on my lap and sang me a nursery rhyme. So we were very optimistic about the progress she might make. Apparently soon after that she was taken into hospital for some tests and uh, when she came out of hospital, she's never talked again. Now, unfortunately, while she was in hospital, the grandma died. So whether this is a reaction to the grandma dying being a kind of ultimate last straw, you know, or more likely something that was done to her in hospital, I don't know. But She's a very difficult child and the other children don't want to play with her and you'll see why in a minute. Uh, she's unpredictable. Um, so it's not all absolutely perfect progress. So here we go. See, there was no reason for that to happen and children don't want to play. Could you freeze it there? This is not just these children, but most children don't want to play with children who are unpredictable. Uh, curiously, children quite often don't mind playing with bullies. They don't mind playing with dominant other children, but they're not keen to play with children who are unpredictable. Well, I had a boy who lived next to me when I was a child, uh, who I better not name, uh, and none of us would play with him. And I, rem I remember saying to my father, why do you think it is no one will play with him? And, and my dad said, it's because when you're standing on the railway platform, pretending to push each other onto the tracks, he would do it. 
and it's kind of a chilling idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't predict what that child would do. So you don't play with him. Uh, so the, the, I think this is the last one. Could you just show that? So this is Carol. So I said before, didn't I, that Carol is HIV positive. So six years on, he should have died. Uh, I was in this centre looking for the children and suddenly a little boy is holding onto my trousers, grabbing my trousers. And I looked down and it's Carol. And uh, he said, I know you. Uh, now, I was completely blown away because I thought he would be dead by now. Um, but it turns out he's not HIV positive. And of course, that's not possible. You can't, you know, it doesn't go away. <laughs> you may be able to control it to some extent nowadays, but it doesn't go away. Um, so I think the hospital maybe didn't do the test properly or something. But, you know, we were told he was HIV positive and clearly he wasn't. So that's good news. Uh, this lovely lady on the left here is a retired teacher who helps the children catch up. Carol is now uh, nine years old. He's, they don't go to school until they're seven in Romania. Um, so he's been at school for a couple of years. She's helping him with his counting and his, and his reading. So he's gradually, he's gradually, gradually catching up. Uh, which is very heartening indeed. And uh, you just said name every day, which means may God go with you. Uh, now, I, the, the charity is not a religious charity or anything. I'm not on, wanting to sort of push that, but it's nice that he would say that to me. Okay, now, before I stop, that's the end, but before I stop, I must say this. My wife will ask me whether I said it. Uh, Romanians love their children. Uh, it's very easy to watch this sort of stuff and get the impression that oh, Romanians, the way they treat their children, it's absolutely appalling. But it's not true. Romanian is a very Latin sort of like, uh, country and uh, they love having their children around all the time. It's very, very different from the UK where, you know, the predominant feeling is children should be seen and not heard. Um, but I think there's a hangover from the communist era where I'll, I love my children, I'll have my children around, but I'm not really, really too bothered about what's happening to other people's children. That, that there's, there's not that feeling. But anyway, Romanians love their children, I've said it. Um, okay, thank you very much.